We dealt with the second chapter of the book of Daniel by way of the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had. And now we are going to turn to the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, which we have somewhat of a parallel with the study that we had last uh, Lord's Day. And uh, if you'll simply look at the chart, we'll try and localize ourselves once again. <clears throat> at the time of the writing of the second and the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, Daniel the prophet was in what is known as the Babylonian captivity. That's where the children of Israel had been taken because of their rebellion and because of their sin. And <clears throat> Daniel is being used of the Lord to unveil some wonderful truths of God, primarily dealing with the time called the last days. Now in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, I read right in verse 1, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Now then, again, we are still in the kingdom of Babylon. Now then, the book of Daniel does not necessarily constantly stay in that particular time period, but these two chapters, which are so important, that deal with the prophetic truth of God, they do occur during this time which is called the Babylonian captivity. And so <clears throat> that will localize the time period as far as our study is concerned this morning. I simply want to read the first three verses and then we'll stop and have a word of prayer. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed then he wrote the dream and told us some of the matters. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. All right, let's pray. Our Father, again, we're thankful for such a beautiful Lord's Day, for the privilege which is ours of being able to meet together in this fashion, we're thankful, our Father, to have some of the dear folk back who've experienced such uh, times of great stress and physical trial, and we pray that you'll continue to minister to these needs and to love them in a very special way. Then for each one that you've brought out this morning, we would pray that our hearts might be encouraged together that as we study from the word of the Lord the truth of your revelation, may the Spirit of God take these truths and wonderfully encourage us in the Lord. Now, Father, there are a number of dear folk who are away today for one reason or another. We would ask that you would minister to their hearts, wherever they may be, that they might be refreshed spiritually and physically and throughout these summer months that we might be uh, refreshed in such a manner in your will that we'll be able to walk uh, a little more pleasing to yourself. So we wait before you now for the teaching ministry of the Spirit of God upon our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Now then, it's always been a joy to me to take the second chapter of the book of Je Daniel and the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel and see uh, two or three great contrasts. Now, in Daniel chapter 2, it is uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan king of Babylon, that had the vision. And uh, in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, it is the uh, godly uh, prophet Daniel that has the vision. And because of the status of these two individuals, uh, the vision is, uh, in, is set, up, uh, set in great contrast one to another, but with a similarity of meaning. Now, Nebuchadnezzar sees the vision or has the vision of a great image made of gold, silver, brass, iron, and clay. Now, what he sees, he views it in light of its great value. 
he views it in light of the value that he would place upon certain things. He, uh, he places a great deal of stress upon the gold, the silver, and the brass, and the iron, and the clay, and it represents power, it represents possessions, and all of this. But now when you come to the prophet Daniel, and he has a vision, he sees more or less the same general prophetic truth, but he sees it in light of its true characteristic and that is, he sees it as beasts, beasts. And it's quite a contrast. From God's perspective, it is beastly. From man's perspective, it is, to be, it is something exalted and something to be greatly desired. Now then, let's once again view this particular prophetic truth in light of the word of the Lord, and we're going to, I trust, have a good time just simply in the seventh chapter of Daniel. All right, verse 4. The first beast was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and, man st and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Well, this particular beast is an amazing thing. It's called the, called the, uh, the king uh, of the beasts. Isn't that right? The lion is known as the king of beasts. But this king of beasts, something happens to it. And I just simply like to refer to this lion as the docile lion. He's so changed that uh, uh, he isn't the uh, raving, raging um a lion that is the uh, king and uh, master of uh, the forest? No, he is one that was that way, but he's had a new heart and he has been changed. Now then the second beast is found in verse 5. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear. It is ray... It, it, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. All right, now here's a bear that is very carnivorous. It is a bear that uh, uh, devours flesh, but uh, there's something just a little bit peculiar about it too. It's raised up on one side, and that it, it's a lopsided thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a bear. If you take a look at it, why, well, he'd be loping along, but he'd be loping along in, in a, uh, a manner that uh, it'd flop around and flop around and flop around because it's off balance. It's raised up on one side, and we're going to see something about that a little bit later. And after this, <coughs> I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. And the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now a leopard is a, a cat, a cunning thing, that is very, very swift, <coughs> and its speed is uh, accentuated here uh, because of the wings that it has. And not only has one pair of wings, but it has four wings. And uh, uh, I like to liken this particular um, beast, the leopard, uh, and call it uh, the jet-propelled leopard because it's something that really moves, moves and moves with a great deal of speed. And uh, it is something that uh, has dominion. Dominion, and if you have dominion, why, you're master, isn't that right? You rule over something. Now then, here's the fourth beast in verses 7 down through verse 8. Now, here is something that uh, is an amazing thing, and it's one that occupies the greatest attention of, the, of Daniel as he has this vision. After this, I saw in the night visions... And behold, a fourth beast. Now notice something about it. It's dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. 
and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stomped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Well, as far as this fourth beast that Daniel sees in the vision, there isn't any beast upon the face of the earth that he can liken it to, is there? We do not have a similarity of beasts upon the earth that he can say, well, now this is like a unicorn, or this is like a giraffe, or this is like such and such. No, there isn't a beast on the earth that has any particular characteristic to it that this fourth beast can be um, associated with. So this fourth beast is not known by identity as far as the beasts of the field are concerned. This fourth beast is noted by its character its character and this is so very important as you understand it in light of prophecy and the first thing as far as its character is concerned is that it is a beast with a very very terrible horrible awful character a beast that's dreadful terrible and awfully strong very strong so what beast is there that can be likened to this fourth beast. Now, I suppose one of these days, Hollywood is going to make a movie. If someone uh, ever gets to the book of Daniel, starts reading the book of Daniel, and so they'll probably devise some kind of a hideous thing uh, to uh, illustrate this fourth beast. But be that as it may, whatever is ever uh, looked at as far as the fourth beast is concerned, it is something that is beyond description by way of being terrible. Now then, he gives us in the next clause uh, something about its appearance. Well, it has great iron teeth. Well, this particular beast, <laughs> I don't know uh, what dentist he went to, but uh, he, he, he got a, a, a new set of dentures, didn't he? And uh, this set of dentures is made out of iron. And um, uh, terribly iron teeth. Now then, the second thing I know about this terrible creature is his actions. It devoured, and it broke in pieces, and it stomped the residue with the feet of it. Well, with these iron teeth, there wasn't anything that it couldn't eat. It couldn't devour. And then it also just simply snapped things and broke them up. And then you have the trampling feet. He just stomped the daylights out of that which was left. And uh, then I noticed something about its composition from here on out, and it was diverse from all beasts before it. Well, it's different from the lion, it's different from the, from the bear, and it's different from the leopard. It's, uh, it's uh, a, a different uh, beast in light of its character from the three which has just been mentioned. Now then, it had ten horns this terrible, dreadful, exceedingly uh, uh, awful beast. It's got ten horns to it. And he said, now, uh, I looked at those ten horns. Those ten horns uh, took my attention. And uh, it says, listen, there came up among those ten horns another little horn. So with the ten horns, there was uh, the eleventh one that came up in the midst of these ten horns. And something happened before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. This one horn that came up among the ten horns, it simply uh, did something to three of the horns. Uh, there wasn't enough room, 
And uh, so this one horn uh, simply obliterated uh, the other three horns. And now let's, let's, let's look at this little horn, this one horn that comes up. It's, a, it's an amazing horn. And behold, in this horn, well, there were eyes like the eyes of a man. Now, this is a, this is a hideous thing, isn't it? There's a horn. Uh, if you go out there and take a look at Abraham, our bull, well, there isn't any, <laughs> there aren't any eyes in, in his horns. Now, um, uh, we we didn't have the fence up, and uh, uh, they were pushing the corral and knocking the things off of the corral, so we just turned them loose and put the van across for a gate. And you can see some of the results of it as you look around the chapel. But uh, old Abraham, uh, he came over here at the chapel, and uh, it wasn't because he wanted to go to church or anything, but uh, he found this little tree out here. Well, you know what he did to that little tree? You just take a look at it and see what he did to it. He took those horns and uh, he, he just uh, uh, made that tree look a lot different than it used to look. And uh, uh, he, he can use his horns. But I'll tell you, I'd hate to see a big horn that's, got, that's filled with eyes. And those eyes can look and see and so forth. And then on top of the eyes, there was a mouth. It also had a mouth, and that mouth was very busy. It spoke great things. Well, here are four hideous beasts. The lion, the bear, the leopard, and the fourth beast with ten horns that lost three but gained another that has eyes and a mouth, and it would speak great, great messages. Well, his view changes now. As Daniel looked and saw these four terrible beasts, he said, I want to tell you about something else I saw. Well, I beheld, or I watched, and I looked till the thrones were cast down. Well, we're talking about a throne, and a throne involves a king, isn't that right? All right, something is referred to in this verse as kings in a context which precedes it. Now then, in place of the kings and the ancient of days did sit. Well, we're going to find out something about the ancient of days in light of this context, whose garment was white as snow. All right, the ancient of days is present. And he has a robe of snow-white garments, and the hair of his head was like pure wool, and his throne like the flaming fire, and his wheels as burning fire. My, here's a, here's a, a scene with one of all purity, perception, fiery flames, burning fire, and what does that relate to? Well, we're going to see in verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Here's a fire that comes out from this ancient of days. And I'm told thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. Now I know something about the one that's called the Ancient of Days here. He's sitting on a throne, but it's a throne of judgment. It really is. And there are thousands that are ministering to him, and there are many others that are standing before him. Here is a time of unparalleled judgment, and he judges according to books. The record is open before him. And then Daniel said, All right, I kept watching. And I watched then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. And I went back and I looked at that horn in view of this terrible judgment, 
And he said, I heard some things that this horn spoke. And I beheld till that fourth beast was slain. And his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. That fourth beast, with all of its horns and everything, with all of its greatness of its message and perception, was judged. And it says, as concerning the rest of the beasts, the other three, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So that which follows the vision of the four great beasts is a scene of unparalleled judgment on that fourth beast as well as the other three beasts why they are destroyed also. Then when I come to verses 13 and 14, Daniel says, I want to tell you something else that I saw. Well, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Now then the scene is changing, and we are having a scene in the heavenlies with a message of someone that's coming. And there was given to him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nation, language should serve him. His dominion is, is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So what Daniel sees in the heavenlies, and his scene just changes, but uh, there's some similarities here, but he sees in the heavenlies another person called the Ancient of Days, which is not necessarily the same in verse 9, but the Son of Man associated with the Ancient of Days in the heavenlies, and that person is given a kingdom which is an everlasting eternal kingdom. Now, I'm learning some things by way of just the plain vision. I have learned that these beasts are those that have kingdoms, dominions. I also learn that those kingdoms are judged. I also learn that there's one who comes whose kingdom is forever. So when I come to verse 15, down to the end of the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, I have the interpretation. I have the meaning of it. Well, let's just look and find out what the Bible says by way of an inspired interpretation of this vision. And notice the reaction that Daniel had in light of the vision. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. <laughs> well, uh, I think it troubled me too if I would see what Daniel saw. Now then, I came near unto one of them that stood by, and I asked him the truth of all this. He says, would you please tell me what this means? So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. So Daniel has just testified there was uh, undoubtedly a heavenly messenger standing by, and so Daniel approached the heavenly messenger and said, I want to know the meaning of this vision that I have had. He said, all right, I'm going to tell you, give you the interpretation of this vision. And in verses 17 and 18, notice these two verses, verses 17 and 18, are short statements that are a synopsis. Do you know what a synopsis is? A synopsis is simply a short statement of a book that tells you in a, a paragraph, maybe a, a page, such a matter as that, uh, what the book is all about. And so verses 17 and 18 are just short statements or a synopsis of the entire vision. So verse 17 turns his attention to the vision of the beasts. These great beasts which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Now then, as far as the beasts are concerned, 
there are four kings, four kings, and if you just uh, uh, take your eyes and go across the page, at least it is in my Bible, to verse 23, notice what he says uh, is uh, a parallel with a king. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom. So you're talking about beasts that represent kings on the earth which reign over a particular kingdom. From Daniel's point of view, he's standing here. There's one kingdom, there's another kingdom, there's another kingdom, and there's another kingdom. There are four great kingdoms that come out of the earth. In other words, they are earthly kingdoms. Kingdoms upon the face of the earth that, come, uh, that uh, uh, are made up of kings who are earthly kings. Now then notice what takes place in verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. All right, now then, at the conclusion of those four earthly kingdoms, at the end of them, there are a group of people who are known as the saints of God. And the saints of God then possess the kingdom. In other words, they are the ones that populate the kingdom and their kingdom is going to be an eternal kingdom. So we have a great contrast before us with reference to the matter of the vision of the beasts and the vision of the Ancient of Days and the vision of the Son of Man who has a kingdom and that dominion is forever. So you're talking about a course of activity up on the face of the earth that one of these days man is going to be over with as far as man's dominion and rule is concerned. But up on the face of the earth will arise a group of people known as the saints of God. Now, it is wonderful to know something in this connection. Man may rule, but man's rule is going to end one of these days. The saints of God who endure the matter of difficulty, tribulation, trial, stress, opposition, persecution, and all of these things under the kingdoms of men, one of these days that's going to be over with. Absolutely so. And then they are going to enter into the fullness of the blessing of life with the Lord, and it's going to be eternal. Friends, I don't know about you, but I'm glad that by the grace of God, one day I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And even though I may be, from some people's point of view, on the losing team now, what they don't understand is that the team that the world thinks is a puny, anemic, worthless, insignificant, and I don't want it type of life and type of relationship. They don't realize it, but that's the group that's going to be victorious one of these days. But it's going to be, as we shall see, according to the timetable of God. So I would just like to close our Sunday school this morning with the exhortation of 1 Corinthians 15, 58 for you again. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye you know, your labor's not in vain in the Lord. Now, if we as believers want to bury ourselves with the worldly spheres of authority, the worldly spheres of values, the worldly spheres of life and so forth, 
well, we're going to lose out. We are uh, living a losing type of life. And it's going to be a great shame that one of these days when his kingdom is established, and you may live that way still being a believer, but my, the terrible embarrassment that's going to come upon your life when you stand before him and he then distributes to the saints their place of rule in that kingdom and rewards to, to be enjoyed throughout the ages of eternity. Now then, suppose you are an employer and you've got a rascal working for you that every time you turn your back, he's off someplace finding a shade tree. And uh, uh, you come along and say, well, where is that rascal Al clock? Well, I don't know. And so he begins to look around and he finds me out there snoozing under the shade tree. And uh, he, what are you doing there? Well, I got tired. And he said, well, you're supposed to be working. Oh, well, that's just what I'm going to do right now. Thank you for waking me up. And I go back and I work until he goes again. And then I go off and I sleep again. Well, before too long, the employer is going to get tired of that kind of activity. Isn't that right? And um, he is uh, going to say, well, I think that you need to have your pay docked. He doesn't want to fire me. And so he, he cuts my wages, and he does all of this. And I said, well, I'm going to quit and go on welfare if you're going to do that. Uh, and I can do that now since we've got a welfare state. But uh, uh, listen here upon the face of this earth we have rewards for faithfulness now in light of our employment and so forth but one of these days think what it's going to be from the standpoint of eternity eternity if I live with him now and I don't care how hard the difficulties are if I stay faithful to him now you see, I'm on the winning side because one of these days his kingdom, it says, is going to be forever and the saints are going to possess it forever and ever and ever and ever. That's the side I want to be on. That's the group that I want to be with. And I want to be in a relationship with the Son of Man in such a relationship to him that throughout the ages of eternity I'm not going to feel an embarrassment by way of my pilgrim journey with him now. Our Father, we're grateful for your word, and we just pray that as we uh, continue our survey of uh, biblical and prophetic study that the applications of these truths